this chapter, we'll be investigating muscle cells and how they produce movement. We'll basically be covering the structure, the contraction, and metabolism of skeletal muscle at the molecular, cellular, and tissue levels of organization. So this is the physiology. Understanding muscle at these levels provides us indispensable basis for understanding aspects of motor performance, like why we need to warm up how we can get the quickest performance, the most strength, and the most endurance from our muscles, what causes fatigue. Such factors have really obvious relevance to athletic performance, and they become really important. And they become really evident when we look at people with a lack of physical conditioning, people that are going into old age without exercise, or when we see injuries that interfere with a person's ability to carry out everyday tasks. There are three types of muscle. There's skeletal, cardiac, and smooth muscle. This chapter addresses predominantly skeletal muscle. We'll address cardiac and smooth at the end. But muscle cells, regardless of their type, are capable of converting chemical energy of ATP into mechanical energy of movement. And movement is the fundamental characteristic of all living things. To carry out all the functions that we addressed in the last chapter, like movement, stability, communication, control of body openings and passages, heat production, muscles need to have the following characteristics. They need to be responsive or excitable. They're responsive to chemical signals, to stretch, electrical changes across the plasma membrane. They also need to have conductivity, in which local electrical changes trigger a wave of excitation that travels along a muscle fiber. This conductivity will cause contractility, which is that the muscle simply shortens as it's stimulated. And in addition, it needs to have extensibility. We have to be able to stretch the muscle between contractions. The muscle will also have elasticity, which means that not only can we stretch it between contractions, but it will return to its original resting length after being stretched. Skeletal muscle is voluntary muscle. It's striated, and it's attached to one or more bones. The striations you can see here in the slide are alternating light and dark transverse bands across a muscle fiber. They result from the overlapping and interaction of contractile proteins that we'll all investigate soon. These muscles are voluntary. That means that they are usually subject to only conscious control. The muscle cell is the same thing as the muscle fiber. It's also called a myofiber. They can be as long as 30 centimeters. You've seen these muscle fibers when you've seen various cups, cuts of meat. Particularly in a flank steak, they're large. So remember that skeletal tissue is not just composed of muscular tissue, but also fibrous connective tissue, as well as the endomecium that surrounds each muscle fiber, and the paramecium that bundles the different muscle fibers together into fascicles. This connective tissue is continuous with the collagen fibers of tendons, and in turn with connective tissue of the bone and matrix. Collagen is somewhat extensible and elastic. It stretches slightly under tension and then recoils when it's released. This allows the muscles to resist excessive stretching and protects them from injury. It allows the muscles to return to their resting length and contributes to the power output of muscle efficiency. In order to understand muscle function, we have to know how the organelles and the macromolecules of a muscle fiber are arranged. Perhaps more than any other cell, a muscle fiber exemplifies the saying that form follows function. The plasma membrane of a muscle fiber is called the sarcolemma. Sarco is going to come up over and over. Thus, sarco replies to muscle. The sarcoplasm is the cytoplasm of the muscle fiber. Inside the muscle fiber that you can see here are myofibrils, which are long protein bundles that occupy the main portion of the sarcoplasm. 
The myofibrils shouldn't be confused with myofibers. Myofibers are the whole cell itself, but inside the cell there are hundreds of these long myofibrils. The cell also contains an abundance of glycogen, which is a starch-like carbohydrate that provides energy for the cell. And then it has a red pigment called myoglobin. Myoglobin acts a lot like hemoglobin, but it's working inside the muscle to store the oxygen needed for muscle activity. There are multiple nuclei in each skeletal muscle fiber. These nuclei become flattened and pressed against the inside of the sarcolemma. You can see them here in purple. Skeletal muscle fibers are usually multinuclear. This condition results from their embryonic development in which several stem cells or myoblasts fuse together to form one fiber. Some of the myoblasts remain unspecialized. They're called satellite cells and they remain between the muscle fiber and the endomesium. When the muscle's injured, these satellite cells can multiply and produce new muscle fibers only to some degree. In general, once we reach adulthood, we have the same number of muscle fibers for the rest of our life. It used to be thought that muscle fibers did not regenerate. However, we now know about these satellite cells, and in the case of injury, they can produce new fibers. Most muscle repair, however, is usually from fibrosis rather than regeneration of muscle fiber from satellite cells. That means that scar tissue forms. We also see a lot of mitochondria packed in between the spaces between the myofibrils. These mitochondria are very important in our slow oxidative muscle function. They need to do all the metabolism to generate the ATP necessary to fuel the muscle's conversion into mechanical energy. Inside the muscle cell, the smooth endoplasmic reticulum that you can see here in blue forms a network around each myofibril. In the muscle cell, the endoplasmic reticulum is called the sarcoplasmic reticulum, or SR, and it functions as a vast reservoir for calcium. And as you'll see, calcium is very important in muscle contraction. The sarcoplasmic reticulum sometimes ends in dilated end sacs. You can see these here at intervals along the myofibrils. These sacs are called terminal cisternae, and they cross the entire muscle fiber. The sarcolemma, or the cell membrane, has tubular infoldings called T-tubules. These are literally like little hose pipes that come from the surface of the cell and spread down and around each of the myofibrils. There are little tunnels that literally emerge all the way through on the other side of the cell. They act in propagating the signal, the electrical signal from the cell membrane, all the way through and around each of the myofibrils. You might also notice here that the terminal cisternae are on either side of these T-tubules. This is so the signal can get passed into the sarcoplasmic reticulum and calcium can be released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum to allow muscle contraction. This arrangement of two terminal cisternae and a T-tubule is called a triad. Now it's really hard to envision what's going on with the T-tubules, but if you see here there's one T-tubule that's kind of been exposed, you can see how they literally wrap around the muscle fibers and penetrate down between them. Remember, they're like electrical wires that are going to conduct signal all around each of the myofibrils within each muscle fiber. Take a moment here to see if you can put this together. Diagram the cell structure of a muscle fiber. Include each of the components in the last slide. We'll look at the different myofibrils, the sarcoplasmic reticulum, the sarcolemma, what constitutes a triad. And then we'll take a look at more detail at what's going on within each myofibril. So each of these myofibrils, each bundle, is made up of predominantly two proteins. Those proteins are actin and myosin.
or thin and thick filaments, respectively. Let's look first at the thick filaments. The thick filaments are pictured here. They're made up of several hundred myosin molecules. Each myosin molecule is shaped sort of like a golf club. You can see the myosin molecule in the top picture. Several hundred of them come together in a rope-like form with their heads directed outwards in a helical array around the bundle. Now let's look at the thin filaments. The thin filaments are called actin or fibrous actin. They're two intertwined strands. So actin is made up of two strings of molecules. They're much like beads on a necklace. The F-actin is the string that goes through each of the beads. And then arranged along the F-actin, we'll see G-actin or globular subunits, these red beads. Now, the white here is not the string. The string goes all the way through the middle of the beads. Each of these beads has an active site on it that could bind to a myosin molecule. These myosin heads that you see on the large myosin molecule bind to active sites on the actin molecules. You can't see the active sites right now because tropomyosin molecules are covering it up. These long strands here of white are called tropomyosin. Each of these strands is going to be blocking the active sites. If they weren't blocked, then our muscles would be at full contraction all the time. So it's really important that we have tropomyosin present in order to block the active sites on the G-actin. In addition to tropomyosin, we have troponin. Troponin are these little yellow molecules here. They're small calcium binding proteins. And these small calcium binding proteins act like clips to hold the tropomyosin down on the active sites. So literally, the yellow things here are clipping the white string onto the beads so that the active sites are covered. We can reveal the active sites on the actin if we unclip them or move the troponin molecule. So again, troponin is the clip that holds tropomyosin, which is the strand that covers, onto the G-actin, thus covering the active site. So now let's look at the thick and thin filaments together. Remember myosin, this big long purple molecule here, much thick, it's the thick filament. And then we can see actin. Actin is this red filament here. Don't worry about the green yet, we'll come to that. But we see that actin and myosin overlap in this fashion, where the myosin heads could grab on to the red beads of the actin and shorten this sarcomere or shorten this section of the myofibril. So here we are looking at a sarcomere. The sarcomere extends from Z disc to Z disc. The Z disc is a string of proteins. We don't need to really worry about their structure yet. The actin filaments are attached to the Z disc on either side. And the myosin filaments are not. Thus, the myosin can move along or climb along the red actin molecules towards each end of the sarcomere. It's much like these little guys, these myosin heads that you see here, are oarsmen in a boat. And they literally row along the actin to shorten the distance between the Z disc and the end of the myosin. We'll look at the details of that shortly. But first, let's just look at the anatomy of the sarcomere itself. So this is where the striations come from in muscle tissue. Like you can see in this figure, this is where we have the thick filaments, and this is where we have only thin filaments. Where the thick and thin filaments overlap, we have dark bands. These dark bands are called A bands. On either side of the dark band, overlapping two different sarcomeres, we have light regions that are called the I band. Now remember, the I band encompasses two different sarcomeres. However, the A band is in the middle of the sarcomere. Down the center, 
we have an M line or a middle line. Right in the middle of the A band, we'll see a slightly lighter region. It's still quite dark because of the thick bands of myosin, but this is called the H band, where it's just slightly lighter, right in the middle of the A band. So in order for the muscle to shorten, the individual sarcomeres shorten. That is, the Z discs are drawn closer to each other by the act of myosin heads rowing along the actin filaments. So here again, looking at the micrograph, we can see the sarcomere, the functional unit, going between Z disc and Z disc. We have the A band in the middle, a slightly lighter region down the center of that called the H band, an I band of lighter material between the A bands that crosses over a Z disc. And we have the M line, the very middle line of the H band and A band. Now, you may have noticed in this figure an additional green protein. This green protein is called titan or connectin. It's a huge springy protein. They flank each thick filament and anchor it to the Z disc, basically so this whole thing couldn't be apart. So they anchor the thick filament here and bind it to the Z disc. It's represented by this curly structure, so it's springy. It helps stabilize the thick filament and center it between the thin filaments. It prevents overstretching. Basically, without this, once the sarcomere got very long, these rowers could simply row off the end of the actin filaments and the whole thing would fall apart. In addition, there are some accessory proteins. This figure gives us a little too much detail, but you can see the sarcomere here, or the end of part of a sarcomere here. Now, we have all these myofibrils contracting inside of a cell, shortening here between these striations, right? Z disc and Z disc, and we see that this whole region would shorten. Now, that's great to have all the fibers inside the cell shorten, but how do we get the cell itself to shorten? We need to anchor these myofibrils to the cell membrane somehow. And that's where the protein dystrophin comes in. Dystrophin is one of a series of proteins that anchors the sarcomeres or the myofibrils to the cell membrane so that actually the whole cell contracts, not just the proteins within it. Now I bring up dystrophin primarily because you've probably heard of muscular dystrophy. Dystrophy is a result of a defective dystrophin protein. So in muscular dystrophy, we see that there is ineffective contraction of the muscles. That's because the sarcomeres are shortening just fine inside the muscle itself. However, because the myofibrils are not connected properly to the cell membrane, the muscle itself doesn't change length effectively. So you don't need to know all these different proteins in here, these linking proteins and so on and so forth. Just that dystrophin is the protein that goes wrong during muscular dystrophy. And that the function of dystrophin is to anchor the myofibrils to the cell membrane of the muscle cell or the muscle fiber. So that brings us to the end of our segment on the microanatomy of muscle fibers. Go ahead and now diagram what a sarcomere looks like. In fact, put three sarcomeres in a row. We have one sarcomere pictured between here and here. And then we have a portion of a sarcomere here and a portion of a sarcomere here. You draw three whole sarcomeres and diagram out at least on one of them where the A band, the H band, the Z discs, the M line, the I bands, etc. are. This will be part of the diagramming assignment for this week, so you may as well do it now. Let's quickly check out one of the animations from Anatomy and Physiology Revealed. Hopefully, this will demystify the microanatomy of muscle slightly. Skeletal muscle is responsible for a voluntary movement of the human body. Skeletal muscles are made up of muscle fibers with connective tissue wrappings.
The dense, fibrous connective tissue surrounding the entire muscle is called the epimysium. At the ends of the muscle, the epimysium is continuous with the tendons and periosteum of the bone. Thin projections of connective tissue called paramysium extend from the epimysium into the muscle to surround bundles of muscle fibers known as fascicles. Within each fascicle, loose connective tissue called endomysium separates individual muscle fibers. A muscle fiber consists of a single elongated cell surrounded by a plasma membrane known as the sarcolemma. Each muscle fiber contains multiple nuclei that are found just beneath the sarcolemma. Thread-like structures called myofibrils extend the length of the fiber and dominate its interior. Myofibrils, which are unique to muscle, are composed of two kinds of protein filaments, actin or thin myofilaments and myosin or thick myofilaments. The actin and myosin myofilaments are organized in an orderly contractile unit called a sarcomere. The sliding of these filaments along each other shortens the sarcomere. When multiplied millions of times within a muscle, the shortened sarcomeres result in muscle contraction and, ultimately, movement of the skeleton. Remember, there are plenty more animations out in Anatomy and Physiology Revealed. Next, we'll move on to the section on the muscle-nerve relationship.